The first Adobe Illustrator secret is based around this little tool right here, the Smooth tool. So I have the same vector shape duplicated over to the right. And normally people will grab the Smooth tool and just start drawing along their path or their shape. Often the results won't work out too well or as they expect. Now here, just for demonstrational purposes, let's say I want to get this shape to be more circular and more smooth. The quick and the simple secret is this. Instead of drawing with the smooth tool, simply just click on your path or your anchor points. Your path should smoothen out in a more uniform and a more practical way. Now I personally like to use both methods in combination together. And ideally, we want to get as few anchor points as possible, which this method does help with. Every situation is different though, of course. It's just nice to know the smooth tool functions differently if you click your paths as opposed to drawing on them. And of course, also we can come over to the tool presets, double clicking right here. The second secret is found here by clicking the three dots at the very foot of the toolbar menu. And then we navigate up to here to open a different menu and create a new toolbar. Now you might be asking yourself, why? Why are we doing this? Well, sometimes we need quick access to tools that don't necessarily have keyboard shortcuts. A prime example is the Smooth tool that we just used a minute ago. The Smooth tool is one of those shy tools. It's hiding always behind the Shaper tool. We normally have to hold down a click here, highlight the Smooth tool, then select our design again, and then actually select the smooth tool. Annoying, right? Instead, just make a new toolbar and put in the tools that you want to use for your current project or your process. And bingo, away you go. And as we work, we can apply tools to the toolbar simply by using their keyboard shortcuts if they have shortcuts to them. And in my experience, having a new toolbar for each project does save a lot of time. We can actually make a new document, which is a template, and we can open up pre-made templates right here. They are pretty useful, and there is quite a wide selection, but we should personalize templates for our workflow when using Adobe Illustrator. So here is an example. This document is perfect for when I create a thumbnail for my YouTube videos. I have some placeholder text with the right font and the right character settings. I have guides put in place and I have some assets off to the right of the artboard that will come in handy during my workflow. And I also even have a branding swatch selection in the swatches library. So if I go ahead and save this template here, I can then open up this document as a new document anytime I want to work on a thumbnail for a video and of course, there'll be many things set in place that will save me wasting time every time I make a thumbnail. Now you might not be able to save a template and that's because you do not have permission to save into that specific folder on your computer. And on a Mac, here is the right path to that folder and you're going to want to make sure you have the permission to read and write into the specific folder in your Adobe Illustrator application. Now I can't remember where I heard about this next tip, but it's so useful. I think you guys are going to really love it. So let's say you're working on a logo or an icon or pretty much any design for that matter. The tip here is to take a screenshot every now and then of your design process and how your design is coming along. And then when you've had a good long session at designing, it's time to take a break. But before you do take that break, email all of the screenshots to yourself. Then simply go and do something else, like make some tea, exercise, or maybe go for a walk or something like that. And whilst you're doing this, find some time to review and open up that email with those screenshots that you saved earlier. This will allow you to see your designs in a different light, in a different situation, and thus with a different mindset.
Also, because you're viewing it on a different device, you will be able to see the design in a completely different resolution, a different screen. This will let you see imperfections a lot easier, and then you might have a different way or a different idea on how to evolve the design thereafter. So here is a bunch of happy sheep, and as you probably know, we can hold down shift and rotate the sheep to a fixed 45 degree angle. Great, but if I select them all at once and do the same thing, the entire group shifts by 45 degrees. Instead of using the global edits function, we can also just right click the whole selection and then use the transform each function found here. We can then adjust each of the objects with the same values. Aside from the rotate function, we also have things like moving and scaling objects on vertical and horizontal axes, and then also reflecting the objects too. This is one function that not many people use or even know about, but it's been right there the whole time. So here we have a logo, but this logo is an organic logo by nature. And by that, I don't mean it shops at Whole Foods. I mean, the logo itself is very curvy and free flowing. That's opposed to straight line and straight edge logos. When we have designs like this, and perhaps we want to see how it might look in different positions or different kind of layouts, grab the puppet tool and begin to add some notes. Simply play around with your design and see what changes you can make in double quick time. And a quick tip here is that you can press command or control at any time to view your logo without the puppet warp UI. And as I've done here, it's actually wise to make a duplication so you can keep the original design as, well, original. It also acts as a reference point so you can see how the design has changed over time in your process. And crucially, you can see if the changes are desirable or not. Now this is a great way to save time because we don't have to move the anchor points around or even worse than that, make an entirely new design from scratch. Creating a perfectly smooth and functional curves in Illustrator doesn't always require the pen tool or the smooth tool. This next one is really cool and thanks to Dansky on YouTube for this one. I saw it and I simply had to share it with you guys. So if we navigate to the puppet tool, we can apply some effects to stroke paths as you see here. So click and remove the nodes if you want and then put a node at each end of the path and anywhere else in between. And we're soon going to apply some more nodes, but we can actually maneuver our path around very easily in Illustrator and Illustrator never looks so smooth. I mean, look at this. But depending on your design and what you want to do, we can add more nodes and rotate each node as we see fit. And here's the thing, the stroke is still 100% editable. So we can do things like adjust the stroke weight and even something such as coming into the intertwine menu and applying effects such as this right here. And then what about using the width tool, which is shift W on your keyboard. And let's make one of the ends of the path thicker than the other end. And to finish things off here, let's round off the cap at the end of the stroke in the stroke menu. Anyway, here's a really neat way to generate color schemes that you want to use on your designs. Bring an image into Illustrator and then use the create object mosaic function found right here. Use as many tiles as you want, but for me, three for three does seem to work well. So we need to ungroup this selection and then we're gonna create some shapes that are gonna act as a color scheme. It's then a case of using the eyedropper tool to generate the color scheme. And from there, you can manually apply the scheme to your design. But we can take things further and do something that many designers, as well as myself, do actually do. In the swatches panel, click the folder icon to make a new color group while your color scheme is selected. Name it whatever you want or something relevant to your project, and then we can head into the recolor artwork option. This will apply the color scheme to your design in a click of a finger.
And next up, a quick function that few people know about and actually ever use. In Illustrator, you can turn almost anything into a guide. If you select it and then press Command or Control 5, you then have guides instead of whatever vector path you had to begin with. And I personally like to use this when I'm making grids for my logo design and workflow. Well, actually, that's just one method that I use anyway. It's just another one of those hidden things that very few people know about for whatever reason. So I love this tip. Often when we really get into a creative zone, we end up making multiple different artboards on one AI design document. When we come to save this document, we can however use an option that will save each of these artboards as separate different AI files. And that's found here when you go to save as and then hit save. This obviously is useful for sending files to your clients or other designers and just being organized in general. And as you can see in my folder, here are my three samurais that I saved earlier. And before we move on today, a quick word from today's sponsor, the biggest online learning community out there, of course, Skillshare. Now, if you're a creative like me, you've likely come to understand just how important being organized is as a creative or a designer. And that's why I decided to mosey on over to this Notion class by Shante Bean. Now everything here is just split up into easy to digest classes and that's so I can just drop in and finish a section whenever I have time. Also the UI is crispy clean and ultra intuitive to use. So far this has opened my eyes to how useful Notion can be to my design workflow and I'm going to dive deeper into it as I have time throughout the next few months. But Skillshare has so much potential to offer creatives and individuals eager to pick up new and valuable skills. There are literally thousands of classes crafted and led by industry experts in the relevant fields. Things like logo design, freelancing, business, illustration, and a lot more niches to explore. Now this summer could be a great opportunity to invest in yourself and your goals by starting a learning journey on Skillshare. And here's the juicy part. You can use my link in the description box below and the first 500 people to sign up will get a free one month trial to Skillshare. So if you want to pick up a specific skill this summer and onwards, do check out Skillshare, link down below. So the first tip today is a solution to something that's probably annoyed most of you guys and that is when you have various different text boxes and you might want to say, for example, select the bottom text here. Now I can't actually select it because the upper text box is completely dwarfing the smaller one. But if you come into the Illustrator preference settings and into the type menu, you can then turn on the setting that allows you to select type only by the path itself. So now you can grab your text by selecting the baseline of that text really, really easily. Now I have mentioned about optical kerning before, but do you actually fully understand how helpful it can be to you in Illustrator? Now I'd like to say firstly that if you are designing a logo or maybe something with headings, probably is wise to manually kern your text or your typography. But for a quick solution, let's look at this example here. This word has standard default kerning, and as you can see, the spacing between each character isn't that visually appealing at all. But if I switch it over to optical kerning, Illustrator is going to use an algorithm to make adjustments. And for those of you with a good eye for type, you will notice a positive change in the kerning here. Let's have two of the same words and then set them on the screen together so we can properly see the distinction between the two different kerning settings. So yeah, for a quick and an easy way to make the kerning for your text ideal, think about using the optical kerning solution in the character window. The third tip today is an update on a tip in a previous video. I actually forgot to mention something pretty important. So let's quickly first remind ourselves of what that tip was. When you open up Illustrator, you are greeted with Myriad as the font choice and also other various settings. These are the default settings. I can come and change those settings, such as the font, the kerning style, size, and so forth, in the character styles menu. This, however, is not going to remain in place or as a choice once we close Illustrator and then open it up again. And that is pretty annoying, and I don't know why Adobe hasn't addressed that. 
but there is a workaround and that is to apply your settings and then save this as a document template. So once you've got the settings sorted out, go ahead and save your file as a document template somewhere on your computer. You might want to choose a title that is the font choice. And so for example, I would choose Noir. And so then once you have that as a default setting, just create a new document from a template and then navigate to the relevant file template. Also, all of the other settings on your document will also be restored once you open this template. So here is a quick typography tip that not everybody makes use of, and it's a quick change in the casing. So sometimes we have a lot of text, but we want to change it to uppercase, lowercase, or maybe even title case. And you can find that setting in the type dropdown menu, and it is specifically good for modifying titles, headings, and subheadings. And you can see it on screen right now. This is just one of those settings that's there and not many people make use of it. Now I'm sure most of us here know about the type on the path tool, and that can be found, of course, under the type tool. This will allow you to apply text onto a vector path within Illustrator, and it's pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. However, there isn't much room for adjustments here, but that is until you open up the type on a path window, which is going to offer you some pretty cool settings. Now you can flip the text so it appears below but not upside down, and you can also choose settings that arrange the text in different styles around the path. And also a very handy function here is that we can determine where the text sits in relation to the path itself, so above, below and so forth. This typography looks pretty decent right, but what if you want to make something like this in a matter of just a few seconds? Well it's pretty simple actually. Just click your text and head into the appearance window. From the top right menu, add a new stroke and apply a color and a stroke weight. Now you might think that we just simply need to come and offset the path here. But looking at the actual outcome, yeah, this isn't gonna jive. So we need to then come into the effects tab and navigate to the pathfinder and then click add. This will clean up the unwanted areas. But there is still one small issue. Well, it's sort of a personal preference, really. These sections right here, the negative space and the lettering can be annoying. So let's just get rid of them. Come up to Object and Expand Appearance and then press A for the Direct Selection tool. Simply click the anchor point here and then press a backspace until you've deleted the unwanted areas. And now you've got some properly outlined stroke typography. Pretty cool, huh? Now often designers will come into the warp effects panel here and distort or alter the design or the typography. But this is actually quite limited. There are several ways to apply what I'm about to show you. And this is the first way. Now on this circle, I'm using the knife tool to cut into it two times to make three different segments. And once I've done that, I just want to nudge things apart so we have slightly more obvious different segments. This effect works when the shapes are on top of the objects. So here my text layer is lower in the stack. Select the shape and your object, mind the topography, and then come up to Object, Envelope and Distort, and then use Make with Top Object. In this instance, we have some groovy typography, but of course, there are many ways to apply this effect. The important thing is that this isn't that possible with the generic warp presets. Also, things are quicker with this method, which I'm now going to demonstrate. So here we have a rectangle and then we have my text. Let's apply the quick process that we did before and the text will fill up the shape segment as you can see here. And then let's do the same again, but with the text a shade of grey and quickly we do have a neat 3D-esque design. Now it might take some trial and error with how the outcomes end up looking. As example, take a look at what happens here. 
Still looks pretty cool though, and I think that the fact my design is made up of a serif font makes it work, so to speak. But here's another really cool thing that we can do with the Alt Option key. This circle has several stroke effects applied to it, and it's just a single vector shape. So come into the layers window and you'll be able to copy any effects from the circle layer onto another one by holding down, yes, you've guessed it, the Alt Option key. Notice the plus icon above my cursor when I do this. And there, instantly copy the things over to this layer just like that. I think it's a very smart idea to take documents with many different assets of a specific niche and save them somewhere on your computer. So for example, I have many social media icons on this document. Now I can save this in a specific location, and then whenever I need to use social media icons for my projects, I don't have to make one or even search the internet to download them. I have everything I need right here for social media icons. And if you think about it, you can do this for just about anything that falls into a specific group. And this will save you a whole lot of time. So here's a quick trick that few designers know about. I have a stroked path, but if I come up to change the width profile to something else, we can do something pretty interesting with it. Now I can press P for the pen tool and then click one side of the path to reverse the direction. But the path doesn't have to be like a cone. No, 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 we can actually press Shift and W for the width tool and then play around with the ends of the stroke. And the trick will actually work in the exact same way as before. In Illustrator, we can export a save file right here. But at the bottom of the window, we can choose various different file formats. And we can choose which artboards we want to save. And you can also set up a new folder if you haven't done that already. But the real neat thing here is that you can save specific artboards very quickly from one window. And yes, there are various different ways to do this, such as the export access option. But this is another way to be doing that. So we can make responsive labels or buttons. And to do that, first take some text and apply a color of your choice. You then need to open up the appearance panel. In the top right, select a new fill, and this will be our button. We need to apply an effect, and that is to convert to a rounded rectangle. In the new window, we simply adjust the roundness of the corners by nudging your arrow keys on your keyboard, and holding down shift kind of speeds that up by 10 times. We also can adjust the width and the height too. Now, the responsive aspect of this design is that we can edit the text, and the label or the button will change in accordance to our text. This typography is a pretty poor choice, but yeah, you get the idea. And so for my selection here, I press Command G, or that would be Control G on Windows to group them together. Then I duplicate the asset by holding down the Alt Option key. If I select one of them and head into the Global Start Edit, you'll notice some new bounding boxes around my grouped objects. So whatever I do to one of these objects, Illustrator will automatically do the exact same thing to the other assets. So adding gradients, resizing, changing color, you name it, whatever happens to one will be copied over to the other objects. This is great for designs that maybe have patterns or illustrations with lots of similar objects like leaves or clouds. It's just another process that saves you time, which is crucial when it comes to designing something for a client. Time is money, as they say.
So here we have a fresh looking gorilla who quite frankly is managing to rock these sunglasses better than I ever could. But behind him is a circle and we can easily go ahead and click that circle. But sometimes in Adobe Illustrator, we end up having complex designs with many objects stacked on top of each other. If you want to easily click the object below, hold down the command or the control key, click just once, and then click again to select the object below. You can then make adjustments in terms of color, rotation, size, location, and everything else that we like to do as designers. You'll find that it's pretty handy in a lot of different situations in Adobe Illustrator. So let's start with this window right here, the navigator window. You might be thinking to yourself, how is this little panel so helpful? Well, trust me, when it comes to large documents like this one right here, it's a true gem. Now I can scroll around my document via this panel as it shows my entire workspace as a sort of preview. Also, I can just click to a certain point, like maybe the last page on my document. It just makes workflows more intuitive and less stressful, especially on those larger documents. So yeah, the navigator panel, open it up and slap it to your sidebar, just like this. It will come in handy. Firstly, a quick reminder that a compound path is where we have multiple different objects united as one vector path. It's a non-destructive workflow and I can show that here with the circle that now has a crescent cut into it. But if we're working on a specific kind of design, we may want to be very precise with our adjustments. And I have some tips for that right here. Firstly, hit Command or Control Y to enter into outline mode. And then we can take the group selection tool found right here by holding down a click over the direct selection tool. Great, so this is pretty widely and commonly known. But if you click one of the shapes that you want to adjust and then hit R for the rotate tool, you can then hold down the Alt or the Option key and click your cyan crosshair that should bring up a rotate window. Now we can make our precise adjustments of the compound path within Adobe Illustrator. This is essential for things like logo marks or as some people might say, logo symbols, because we do need to keep a precise kind of workflow with those designs. Also, we can drag the crosshair into other areas of our compound path, maybe as here in the direct center. Just like before, press the Alt or the Option key and enter into the rotate mode. Remember, this isn't two shapes. It's a compound path, which is non-destructive. We can also freehand move the inner cutout section by using the group selection tool, as well as making a whole host of other adjustments too. But yeah, the uh, Rotate tool can be used in this way to remain precise, along with maybe the Transform tools as well. These are of course just panels taken from the window drop down menu that I find personally useful in my workflow. But there is a hack or a simple kind of setup preference that I'd like to use. When you have the desired panels you find useful to your workflow, you can click and drag them out so each panel has its relevant name shown on the panel itself. Now this helps because you don't have to memorize every single symbol or icon for each panel. And in the past, I did waste a lot of time trying to find the right tab, but this way you just read the name and it's really straightforward. So here's a great trick that will save you time in Adobe Illustrator and will probably reduce stress, helping you to live a longer, more healthy life. A longer, healthy life is not guaranteed by Story Graphics. The annoying problem is that when we are working on text, say for example here, I'm reducing the spacing between my letters by holding down the Alt Option key and nudging the characters to the left or right. What if I want to navigate to a different place on my artboard? Well, normally we would hold down the space bar and then click to drag, which is making use of the hand tool. But in this situation, pressing the space bar just adds a space to my text. So instead, we can hold down the Alt Option key, which will switch to the hand tool while working on text. You can then hold down the command or control key to access the selection tool. This one really does help in a lot of different workflow situations and I use it all the time.
So come into the color panel and then hover over the color bar found here. Click while holding down the shift key and then you can toggle the color modes from CMYK, HSB, grayscale and also back to RGB. This is obviously a nice little time saving trick and a good addition to your bag of workflow tricks. I'm going to show you the Illustrator Pathfinder tool like you've never seen it before. Unless you happen to be a dev for Adobe, of course, but for the non-developers out there, let's jump into some advanced tricks with this thing. I have here a PNG image and none of this is vectorized or able to be handled in terms of a vector object, but the Pathfinder can help in interesting ways with this object. Now, as you can see, I've made a black shape with the pen tool earlier. And actually, I could neaten this up a tad, but anyway, I have a shape overlaying this layer and then some text off to the left. I'm locking down this PNG with a command or control 2, and then I'm going to place my text in a way that I think is going to work for my design. So, as a reminder, I have the text on top of the black shape and then below that to the PNG. I'm now going to hold down the Alt Option key when clicking functions in the Pathfinder window. And that's such as the exclude option found here. And nope, I don't actually like that effect. So what about the intersect option? That looks pretty cool actually. And I'm also liking the minus front option as well. Again, remember to hold down the alt option keys when you're doing this. But we can go even further than that. And there is something cool about this that you will soon see. Anyway, I can make a freeform gradient on the shape and repeat the same process over a gradient. But yeah, one of the main uses for this is that my text is fully 100% editable. I can rewrite things, change the font, the color, and so on. So yeah, that's the interesting way to use compound paths with the Pathfinder. But what about a problem that I'm sure you've encountered before? I have four black squares, and on top of that, I have this pinky red circle. Now I want to cut this circle into four squares, leaving negative space in the middle. If we select everything, then hit the minus run option, bam, we get this. That's not ideal. Okay, so what if we group the black squares together? Do you think that will work? Command or control G to group them, bring the shape back over, and... Nope, denied. The next logical thing to try, maybe, is to create a compound path from the four squares. So let's go ahead and do that in the Pathfinder panel. Now when I click the minus run option, nothing seems to happen at all. That's because we need to hold down the alt option key like we did before, crucially after we've turned the squares into a compound shape. This is how you cut a shape into multiple objects below using the Pathfinder. Okay, so next, something really cool to remember and to add into your workflow. This is why we use the Alt Option key when using the Pathfinder tool. Yes, these three shapes are in fact united, but I can double click one of the shapes to enter into isolation mode, meaning I can then move things around as I please, scale, recolor, and so on. But also in Illustrator, if I click out of isolation mode, I can still do things to this united object, such as edit the live corners with the direct selection tool. And that is A on your keyboard. The Pathfinder tool is also great for cleaning up a design. But what do I actually mean by that exactly? Well, if I select this object here and quickly press Command or Control K to bring up the preferences, I'm just going to enlarge my anchor points so you guys can see what's going on. Okay, so I have a few unnecessary anchor points on this object. In the Pathfinder options menu, there is an option to clean up redundant points. If you uncheck this, basically turning it off, you will notice that when I click the Pathfinder merge function, nothing happens. However, if I go back and turn that setting on, and then click the merge function, Illustrator removes the redundant anchor points. You can control how precise you want Illustrator to be so that you can keep the original shape intact. Less anchor points are always better as a general rule in Adobe Illustrator. And here's another feature of the Pathfinder tool that designers often do forget about. Say if I go ahead and unite these shapes at the very top, and then I go along with my workflow, I do this, I do that. But then I want to unite the other objects below that as well. 
Instead of clicking the Pathfinder menu, say if I've just closed it or something like that, I can just press Command or Control 4. This is going to repeat the last operation in the Pathfinder. So yeah, there are some neat things with the Pathfinder in Adobe Illustrator. So take two colors that you want to use for your design or that you think might fit the brief. Then press W on your keyboard for the blend tool and then click each square to generate a blend. Then come into the blend options and we will select specified steps. The number of steps you use will dictate how many colors in your swatch group. We then need to expand the entire blend and finally ungroup it so we have the individual squares. This then leaves us with a possible swatch group for our project. And we just need to select them all and then add them into a swatch library like so. It's pretty straightforward and it's a quick way to make some swatch groups for your projects. Oh, also you didn't have to start with only two colors. You could also start with maybe three or four different colors and then go ahead and blend those together. Using more colors at the start will leave you with more options at the end. So you might have to be picky and a bit selective about which colors you bring into your swatch groups. So I have two objects here on my artboard and let's go ahead and group them with command or control G. Also then I'm going to apply a stroke to the entire group. Let's make use of that mouse wheel once more to jack up the stroke weight in an instant. Ooh, wonderful. Okay, so now you'll notice that this stroke has covered each of the two shapes individually. And that might be what you want, but it's not what I actually want today. I want the stroke to move around the edges only of the group. And to do that, we need to come into the appearance panel. In the appearance panel, you need to move the stroke down to below the contents tab. That's right, bring it all of the way down, just like my future bank balance during the upcoming recession. And like promised, that mouse wheel technique works just about everywhere. Now, if we want to click away from our text after we finished writing it out, we normally would have to come up to the selection tool, which is across to the other end of the screen. And you know, it's just really annoying when you do it over and over again in a workflow. So instead, simply press the escape key on your keyboard and bingo, we now have the selection tool ready to use. The second hotkey is all about the eyedropper tool, which is I on your keyboard. That's not the trick. The trick is that, say if I wanted to take this CTA call to action here and I want to use a color sample from the gradient, if I do that, I will actually sample the entire gradient, which is annoying because I don't want that. Instead, hold down shift and then sample your color. And now you're actually going to sample a precise color. Sure, the CTA looked better before in blue, but this is just a demonstration. Now you can also click and hold down that click with the eyedropper tool and actually move away from Illustrator to the edge of the screen somewhere else. And you can sample colors like this, but you often get false colors doing this, but it's also something pretty cool to know. Now here's a quick hack for aligning things in Illustrator. If I want to make a shape directly in the center, just find the center point and then hold down both Alt Option and Shift and click and drag. Now the shape is perfectly in the middle without using any alignment tools or features. We can also use this technique to generate shapes within other objects or shapes, but directly in the center. And then hopping into outline mode, which is Y on your keyboard, we can see that yes, in fact, they are super central. When we're working on text, we often want to kern that text, i.e. adjust the space between each letter. The character window does offer tracking, but we cannot move individual letters around. So instead, place your cursor between two characters while having the text tool activated. Click once and then hold down the Alt or the Option key and nudge to the left and to the right using your arrow keys on your keyboard. This saves us from having to outline the text when manually kerning things. And this one's great for logo type, but also headings for things like brochures or poster designs. It's a trick that I really do use every single day in my workflow. 
Next, not one, but two pen tool hacks that are totally going to change the way you use the pen tool. So when we want to make an awkward shape in Illustrator, maybe a logo mark, some custom typography or something like that, the best thing to do, the best practice is to apply some guides. The guides are taken from the rulers on the edges of your document and you should apply them whenever your shape or your artwork will touch a vertical or horizontal plane. So we want to drag out some handles carefully and you can hold down shift to keep them straight. And then you simply just move to the next point of touch on your shape. Again, click and pull out some handles, but we can actually hold down the command or the control key and then manipulate the handles like so. And you can also hold down shift to keep them level as I said before. That's the first hack with the pen tool. So I'm gonna continue as we started and I'm gonna continue this vector path around the shape. But wait, what if I want to add anchor points while I'm still using the pen tool? Well, press shift and C on your keyboard and then you can do things like this. Pretty neat little function, but once you're finished, you just simply press P for the pen tool again and continue with your path. And then here we finally have our neat and our smooth shape. Lovely. Here's a time-saving trick with the pen tool. Of course, we need to press P for the pen tool first and foremost, and then let's draw out a path like so. Now, as you probably do know, holding down the shift key keeps my path at straight horizontal vertical lines. If we hold down the alt key on a PC or the option key on a Mac, we can turn this bland and boring anchor point into a more interesting and more useful one that now has bezier handles. Again, if you hold down the shift key, you can keep things to those constrained 45 degree angles. I'm going to come up to window and generate a new window, but two more times. So I have three windows of the same document. And then I want to arrange them in a specific order. Uh, this one right here. The left one will be where I actively work on my design and make changes. So I do prefer to move the divider across to the right a little bit. The top right window will act as a kind of semi zoomed out view. And then the bottom right window will be a fully zoomed out view. So now when I go ahead and start working on my design, I see changes across all three windows and have three views of what's actually happening. But this design is actually a really good reminder of something important. I've mentioned this before, but it's such a perfect example, I couldn't help but mention it again. If I pull out some guides on my design here, you could technically align things according to these guides. Technically speaking, this is central, but visually speaking, it's just totally whack. Often a design will need to be aligned visually and not technically. It's a crucial thing to remember when you're actually designing something. And to demonstrate the next tip, I have here a quick vector design that I made from the three circles that you saw earlier. Now, if we open up the graphic styles tab, you will notice a few default options here, but we can add our own graphic styles in this box. Illustrator is going to save the color, the gradient, the effects, the strict settings of your object. It's useful for when you want to make an object that is exactly the same in appearance as something else already on your design. And the time-saving upshots of this should be pretty obvious. The defaults aren't that great, but of course we can build our own library relevant to our projects and our workflows. It's also possible to edit the name of each style by double-clicking them right here. Often when we are working on vast illustrations or designs with lots of different anchor points, the anchor points themselves can get in the way of our view, which let's face it, that can be really annoying. So just press command or control H, that's H for hotel, and then the anchor points are hidden. Now you can press the same shortcut to reveal them once again. It's just a nice way to take a step back, review your work without anything obscuring it.
Did you know that in Adobe Illustrator, you can adjust any numerical values simply by hovering them over with your mouse and then by really going to town with that mouse wheel. This is great for moving a single digit at a time or go crazy and hold down shift while you're doing it to move in increments of 10. This works literally everywhere in Adobe Illustrator and it's super cool. That is until you need to buy a new mouse after having worn out the wheel. That's not so cool. Oh boy, there are some truly annoying things in Adobe Illustrator, but I'm going to help you with some of these workarounds in today's video. And that starts right here with text and deselecting off of it. Now, typically we would actually press V to select away from things, but you cannot do that with text because it just gives you a V. So instead, just simply hold down command on a Mac or control on a PC, and then just click away from your text. You can then hit V or whatever you want to use in terms of tools. For me, this just feels a lot easier and a lot quicker than coming over to the toolbar itself. Now, the next issue is something I'm sure you have experienced before in your graphic design workflows. So that problem I'm sure you've experienced goes a little something like this. You make a new shape in Illustrator and then blammo, the transform window just opens up. This happens every single time you make a new shape and it's highly, highly annoying. To solve this problem, simply come into the menu here and uncheck the show on shape creation button. So now whenever you make a new shape, you won't have the headache of having to close this window over and over again. And as a designer, that feels pretty damn good. Learn more about the awesome workflow tool Millinote later in today's video and also how to sign up for free with a no time limit period attached. Now again, I have some text right here and let's say on this design, I want my text to be the exact same size as this circle. We could outline the text or whatever else, but to remain non-destructive, let's first head into the properties panel for this circle and we're gonna copy the height with command or control C. Great, now we need to press Command or Control T to open up the Characters panel and navigate over to the corner menu. We want to open up the Height Settings panel. And as you can see in the drop down menu, we have several different options open to us. Now the A on my Astro is an uppercase letter, so I'm going to use the Select Cap Height option. We can then paste in the measurements, excluding the letters of course, and hit Enter. So now my A will actually be the exact same size as my shape. Now you might notice that some of the letters won't be the exact same height, but most of them will be. Also, of course, we cannot forget about entering into the preferences settings menu with command or control K. And then make sure our glyph smart guides are in fact activated. And by default, these things are green. But what they do is they allow you to align objects with typography, even though your typography isn't outlined. Instead of Illustrator trying to match an object to the letter bounding box, I can actually align things to the character itself without outlining it. This can help us match anything to our text size as well. And that helps those who don't want to mess around with numbers and copying or paste like we just saw. And here's a super annoying problem that's pretty easy to fix. But guess what? It hasn't been fixed. In Illustrator, if you want to play around with the transparency settings on a design, you have to come into the menu and then just click one by one to see how it's going to look on your artwork. This takes time and it's quite annoying to be honest. But if we move over to Photoshop, and as I'm probably sure you're all too aware of, we can actually just hop into the layers panel and scroll through the blend modes with ease. I really don't understand why Adobe hasn't added something similar into Illustrator, but I will actually forgive Adobe due to the next thing in today's video. Let's say I'm just happily working away on my design right here. And at some point I want to head back in time to revisit a specific part of the process or simply to undo something I did incorrectly. Command or control Z, right? Not anymore with the newest Illustrator update. We now have a handy history panel, which we can literally scroll over and jump to any point in my design process. That's within reason though, of course we can change how many steps we track backwards up to a cap of 250. This is a huge improvement because I don't have to keep smashing that command Z key 200 times a minute. 
Now here's something I'm sure has bugged you even a wee little bit. So you're working away in Adobe Illustrator and you come over to the toolbar to select something. Maybe even you just want to hold down a selection on a tool. But what keeps happening is these tips appear all over the place. You think to yourself, hey, I'm not a beginner anymore, so why is Adobe suggesting these things to me? Well, it's because you have a certain setting activated. Press a command or control K, and that's going to bring up the Illustrator Preferences window, and then head into the General section. Here, we want to turn off the Rich Tool Tips. Now, you might want to keep the Standard Tool Tips activated because they can be helpful and they're not as invasive as the Rich Tool Tips. The next example makes use of some random logo type thrown together and it's not an actual design, just so you know. But it does show a problem that you might encounter with your logo design workflow. This text box is so large that it takes over the entire logo type from the bottom. I can't select it because it's just in the way and overcrowding it. But if I come into the Illustrator preference settings, we can click the option where we only select text by the baseline. And this means that we can navigate our design so much easier just by selecting the baseline of the logo type. And some people, for whatever reason, find their center points have disappeared. And it's often because this setting has been changed somewhere along the lines. So on the design, I have two center points, one for the large square and another one for the center of the smaller shape at the bottom where it was originally a square before I cut it out. And the bottom left segment is in fact cut into the larger square. So let's head into the outline mode with command or control Y and we can make use of these center points. So again, I'm going to use the group selection tool and I can actually click the smaller shape of the compound path and then press R for the rotate tool. Notice how it snaps to that center point and this means I can actually hold down the Alt Option key and then click the center allowing me to perform precise rotations. Now a huge part of logo designing, in my opinion, is being precise and very neat. And working in the way I'm demonstrating today in this video really does help with that. So I can also rotate the smaller shape in relation to the larger square. And remember, this is actually a compound path. So yeah, I could actually just rotate the entire design to gain the same outcome here. But I'm just demonstrating to show you the kind of things possible with rotation within a compound shape. Here's something else that Photoshop does really correctly, and yet Illustrator is still playing catch up. In Photoshop, if we're working on something and we want to shift the canvas around, kind of like if you're sketching on paper in real life and you want to turn the paper to change your perspective, we can either take the crop tool and literally just turn the canvas around like so, or we can actually grab the aptly named rotate view tool. And this does exactly what you think it would do, it rotates your view. But then if we come back into Illustrator, we literally cannot do anything like this. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments down below. But if you're someone who works on digital art, for example, and you use brushes and other things in AI, it might be highly useful if you can actually flip the canvas around or the artboard around. Now, if you've been a bad designer and you haven't been using compiled shapes with the Pathfinder window, here's a quick trick just for you. Now, these two purple diamonds are in fact just holes cut into the shape. If we want to make any changes to them, like we've done before in the video, just press A for the direct selection tool and click one anchor point. Then you just press V for the selection tool and we can now make changes and edits to the cutout holes. And that sort of makes the destructive workflow less destructive, kind of, I guess. But we can even do things like use the Alt Option key to duplicate and make other holes in our shape, which is pretty neat. And yes, I know, these aren't spaced out equally and it's annoying me as well, yeah. we have here a golden hand. And firstly, we need to look at where the light is coming from on our object. And to me, it seems like it's from the left side of the design where the light source would probably be. So my shadow is probably going to point and move towards the right of my design in some kind of way. Get this wrong and your design will simply look unrealistic and just an impossible fact of nature. So let's press L for the ellipse tool 
and then create a shape like so. Now we're going to add a gradient, but the next few steps are very, very important. For one side of your gradient, make sure it's a dark kind of black. And I've gone for a more charcoal kind of black here as opposed to jet black. But for the opposite side of the gradient, we want to sample the background color by pressing I on your keyboard and then just sampling the color. Then heading into the color here, we can copy the hex code with command or control C. Now head back to the gradient and paste in the hex code into the RGB slider with command or control V. We want this side of the gradient to either be 0% opacity or for it just to be a low kind of percent. Make sure your object is to the front of all layers and then add a Gaussian blur to your ellipse. Often when working with raster effects like this in Illustrator, we have unfavorable edges like you can see at the very top edge right here. The best workaround for this is to add a feather effect, which can be found up here at the top. While you're doing this, click preview and have a look at what kind of values work best for your shadow. And then when you're ready, just hit okay. The great thing about this is that we can edit the shape and even the gradient after having added the blur effect. You might even want to add a second darker blur kind of closer to the hand for extra depth. My workflow is slightly different to other people that I've seen, so let's get started by pressing M for the rectangle tool and covering our entire artboard with black or a dark color. Then just press command or control and two to lock this background object down. Great, so next press P for the pen tool, click once, hold down shift, and then click again to make a straight line. We want only a stroke with no fill for this vector path. You can press V for vector to click away from the line. We now need to apply a zigzag effect to the line. Make sure to use the soft setting in this panel and then whatever size you feel like might work best. A lot of this process in today's video will be trial and error and you probably won't get it right first time around. Now we have our curve we need to extrude it. And so head into the 3D classic effects window and the bevel and extrude options. The very first thing you must do is to increase the perspective. And again, how much you apply is entirely up to you. That also goes with the extrude depth and the other values at the top, which indicates the axis perspective. You can just play around with these numbers until you're happy with how your shape looks. Okay, so click the shape and hold down the Alt or the Option key, and then click and drag to duplicate it. We now need to generate some text just like this and make sure the color is white. We're going to turn this into a symbol via, well, you guessed it, the symbol menu. Click the top right corner and then add a new symbol. Give a name to your symbol and avoid typos so you don't look stupid like I just have. Now, we come back into the first shape that we made earlier and click onto it. Open the appearance panel, which is actually one of the most useful and most powerful panels in Illustrator. Double check that your shape is selected and then click the 3D effect right here. Navigate to the map art option and toggle the slider until you see all of the top flat surface highlighted in red. This is where we overlay our text. So once you're happy with the surface, click the symbol drop down menu and find your aptly named symbol. Now it's really annoying that there's no way to scale our text without distorting it because shift keys don't work in this part of the program for some reason. So just try to arrange and scale your text as best as you can. And you might need to flip it because the text might read backwards initially so. But when that's complete, hit okay and we're now going to move to the second shape. For this second shape, double click the stroke panel and change the stroke to white. We also need to come into the 3D effect in the appearance panel for this one too, 
but this time around we're going to change the lighting so we can have the best shadow and highlight possible for our design. So you then bring the shape exactly over the top of the other one, and Illustrator should snap them into place perfectly. Then bring them onto your artboard. We need to come into the transparency menu to change the blend mode for the top shape to multiply. Now I also like to duplicate the shape and experiment with different blend modes. This technique is pretty easy once you know how to do it, and it can provide some neat designs. But if you want to see more content in Adobe Illustrator or just graphic design in general, do click a video on screen. And until next time, guys, design your future today. Peace.